Hey, thanks for joining. You did it. Nice job. Introducing our project management trainer, speaker, author, and coach to thousands of professionals and organizations worldwide, including NASA, the U.S. Air Force, USACE, U.S. Army, the Department of Transportation, the FBI. Your friend, Phil. Over to you, Phil. Hello, my fellow project managers. I hope you're doing awesome today. We are going to be talking about project management in the lens of the PMI. We're going to be taking a look at various templates and tools and ideas from the PMBOK guide. I know a lot of you are in the final run-up to getting certified in 2019, so I thought I'd come on and help you put some finality to this idea of getting certified. And if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to chat them in to the chat box. A lot of times people say, Phil, I, I try to chat, but I couldn't. That's because a lot of times we are streaming content that has been pre-recorded. But in this instance, we are actually going to make this available live. So I'm guessing those of you who tune in frequently to YouTube might catch this. The time right now is 9.12 Eastern, and it is the 26th of November. My goodness, 26th. Some of you have only got one month and three days left or four days left. So big shout out to Mr. Bill, Bill Z from one of our favorite clients out there in North Carolina. Got certified today is a PMP guru and I doff my hat to you, Bill. Bill was part of our Sunday, uh, Saturday, I beg your pardon, warrior sessions. He would come in on Saturday and he will join those of you who are on the program. You remember, but um, he actually was one of my life students from a life class. It's always great when we hear people passing the exam and getting stuff done. Now, I know some of you who are watching are not really in for the exam, and that's cool. You'll still learn a whole boatload of stuff. I'm going to be putting together the full idea of what the PMBOK guide is really telling you, what project management in the lens of the PMI is really telling you. So that's really what I want to present today. Uh, Viola, thank you very much. Uh, dated G Media, I hope you're doing well. Thank you very much for chatting in. If you've got any questions along the way, just feel free to jump in and ask them. So first of all, let's talk about this book called The Pembok Guide. I'm sorry, I don't have my actual copy, but um, I've got an old one, if that counts. I don't even need The Pembok Guide to talk to you about what I want to today because you guys already know a lot of what I'm going to talk about. I'm only going to put some finality to that. I don't really know what they're talking about. That clause, I'm going to put some finality to that. And the idea is to solidify a lot of what you guys already know. So chat in to me. What is the first thing that you do as a project manager who has been invited onto a project? Let, let me know what you think. You're a project manager. You've been invited to a project. You've been asked to drive the project. Can you give me some ideas of what you would typically do as a project manager? And that can kind of drive what we're going to be talking about here. Because there are many different perspectives to project management. You know, if I talk to someone who is studying the world of Prince 2 or someone who's studying the world of APM, they will probably have something else to tell me. But for those of you who are studying the PMBOK guide, I'm guessing I should get a universal answer. A universal answer is pretty much what I'm looking for. So what do you think? What do you think? I see someone said they need to talk to someone. Send us an email. What we typically do is have an email in and one of our team members will get back to you either by email or via phone if need be. But a lot of times we're able to demystify what it is by an email. If you have a question I can answer right now, uh, just shoot it in the chat. But anyway, I see not very many responses as far as what the PM does next. I'm not trying to trick you into answering anything right or wrong. But I just want to like set the pace for our discussion. So let's go over to what my colleague has put together. It is a project scenario. And you may have seen me share this before. It's a fictitious project. So don't get all gung-ho on the content in here. It's a fictitious project. It's not real. But you can see it's a project scenario. And the goal is to design a backpack for people who hike, for people who travel, for people who are all over the place 
trekking up those mountains. A buddy of mine went out to some of the crazy mountains in the Middle East a few weeks ago. Uh, he knows who he is. I doff my hat to him. But for people who do things like that, they need backpacks that are reliable, that are not going to buckle under the, the weather or the heat um, for many, many trips. So that is the idea of this project, to design this backpack. And of course, it's meant to drive certain revenues. And then we've got all the specs for the backpack, what it will look like, um, so on and so forth. And that is really what project management is meant to do from the beginning once you understand what exactly are we doing on this project and, and things such as that. The next step is to uh, do a feasibility study of sorts, you know, and then move ahead with the project. So in this little example we have here, it is a kind of feasibility study for the project. But once the project scenario has been defined, can you guys chat in to me? I'm looking for answers. Answers, answers, answers. Give me some answers. What is the first thing the project manager does? You do know that I get hundreds of emails and, and messages. It is almost impossible to respond to every single message. So if you did attempt to get hold of me, I do apologize. It's just really crazy when I get so many uh, emails and, and texts. I'm not able to get to every single one. But if you send an email to info at praiseon.com, support at praiseon.com, Someone on my team will get back to you. If it's a question about the content in the PMBOK guide, I usually recommend go to the PMI. If it's a question about courseware, course material, and stuff like that, my learning administrator will get back to you. So anyway, the project scenario that we're taking a look at here, my friends, like I said, it's made up. But the first thing you should do as a project manager in the world of the PMI is to ask for the project charter. So in the world of Project Management 101, the project manager needs a project charter. So this scenario obviously is you know, showing you what the project is about. There's been a feasibility study. We know that this is, is, is going to yield some good revenues for the company. It says, with much issue and argument, the external and internal stakeholders are eagerly formulating steps on how to efficiently and effectively handle the project. Okay, so first thing to do is to bring in the PM and to equip the PM with a project charter. So what does the project charter look like? And a lot of folks think a project charter needs to be big. It does not. This is a project charter one of my colleagues put together. And as you can see in this charter, it is a top of the waves about what the project is. For those of you who are new to project management, this is a simple document. Now, it could get become complicated if you make it so, but I think you can make it very simple by putting high level information into it. As you can see here, project description, project and product requirements, initial and high level risks, project objectives, success criteria, person approving the project, the scope of the project, what the schedule milestones are, the high level cost estimates, you can see the initial budget there, and so on and so forth. But I don't, I don't want you to get hung up on this fictitious project. It is fictitious. You can fill in any information you will into the project charter as you see fit for your project. So I want you to get this, my friends. On your exam, you are going to be tested on the details of the project charter. If you have not gone into the PMBOK guide to find the details of the charter, I want to recommend that you do that because your exam will test you on deep details of the key outputs. Deep details of the key outputs. So for develop project charter, for example, the project charter on page 70, is it? Hang on, I'm going to tell you the page. It's page 81. Page 81, where we have the project charter breakdown in the PMBOK guide. All of those bullets are important. You need to know all of them. I'm not saying cram. This is logic. Think about it. You are starting off a project. You should know the purpose. You should have measurable project objectives. You should know the high-level requirements and the high-level project description. You should have an idea of overall project risks, things that can affect the overall state of the project. Summary milestones. You should know what are the key milestones. Like I showed you here, there's a little section 
right and here we just put time duration is eight months whatever on your project you could go a step further and put all of these milestones and beef it up and make it very robust to have all the things PMI is mentioning on page 81. So that is the first thing that the project manager may be involved with, actually. The project manager sometimes is involved with the development of the charter. But I, I know a lot of people blow past this process, and then on the exam, they get a lackluster initiating result. Don't let that happen to you, my friends. Page 81 is where you want to be drinking the Kool-Aid, okay? All of those bullets are very important. And you know one that people often forget? It is this thing that is called the success, the success criteria, right? The success criteria and the exit criteria. So bullet two, it says measurable project objectives and related success criteria. And then the third bullet from the bottom, project exit criteria. What are the conditions to be met in order to close or cancel the project or phase? Those items are important. You could be tested on it. Think about it. Initiating is, is what? Seven, almost. It's six and a half percent. That's a boatload of marks. If you look at one process being worth six and a half, in economies of scale, the most important process is going to be close project or phase because it's seven percent, followed by develop project charter and identify stakeholders. So my friends, you, you gotta get this stuff down, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna focus on the knowledge areas bit by bit. I know I've done other videos where I focus on the process groups, but I want you to just keep keep your eye on, on these knowledge areas, okay? Or I might just mix it up. Maybe I'll just go ahead and mix it up. So that's the project charter, okay? I hope that is clear. Any questions on the charter? Questions on the project charter? Okay, you're all gurus. I didn't think so. No questions on the charter. You know what else you should do while you're studying develop project charter? You want to take a look at page 30-ish. Page, And I know that's going backwards in the PMBOK guide. I know. I know it's going backwards. But I want you to take a look at everything from page 30 to page 35. I say this all the time because what precedes the charter is also important. So all this stuff that I showed you in the scenario, talking about the scenario right here, all this stuff, it is very, very important that you understand page 30. There's stuff that happens before the charter, and this kind of alludes to some of it. All right. So you you do know that there, there are variations of the project charter, just in case you didn't know. I want to call your attention to the CDC website. I talk about this quite a lot on this channel because it is free. You do not need to pay a dime. You paid Uncle Sam, make use of the money you paid him. So right here on this page, you can see we have got many different templates, many, many templates, and we have the charter and the charter light. So let's click on the charter and just get an idea of what this would look like from a different source. So here is a, a much more bulky project charter. If you go down to the table of contents, you can see that this, without any information in it, is 14 pages long. But the top of the waves, you can see the introduction to this document, the project and product review, justification, the scope, the duration, all of this is high level stuff. All right. So I hope I can rest my case here that the project charter is the first thing you need to be looking at. Okay. So that's the project charter. Now going down my laundry list of things, I'm going to jump into something else that you get um, along the way. So imagine you're going through the integration management knowledge area. You first of all develop your project charter. And then the next thing you do is you develop the project management plan. And I want to show you an example of the project management plan. This proves to be a very, very bulky example. But again, you got to use what is available to you. So my friends at the USACE, I doff my hat to them because they've got some pretty good public domain examples. I did teach the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in 
a couple of places in Arkansas and out of LA, Los Angeles, some years ago. And these guys do practice Pembok Guide, I tell you. They do practice the doctrine of the Pembok Guide. They, they've got very, very transparent documents that map directly back to the Pembok Guide. So I'm going to show you one of their documents here as I'm downloading it. But I'm going back to this page here as well. You can also find some variations of what a project management plan would look like. Because after you develop your project charter, you know, you identify stakeholders in initiating. But I'm jumping across to develop project management plan. So I'm going to show you a couple of plans. The first one here is from the CDC. And again, you can see how they have given you a table of content so you can see what's happening. So we've got a section for scope, scope management. You see that? A section for schedule management, a section for cost, a section for quality. If I want it to be PMBOK compliant, I'll make this resource management, communications, risk, um, procurement. Stakeholder isn't here, but you would add one for stakeholder. And that is really what this document is. If you guys have not been to the link, where you can get these CDC documents, I am going to type in the link for you. So for those of you studying and you're looking for templates, some people find it very, very distracting when there are no templates. I understand. If you have not used this stuff the way PMI have, you might want to take a look. Oh, here is our, our friend Mutaz. So Mutaz, you did hear that our buddy Bill is now a PMP, so I'm hoping I can get Bill for a Saturday class to come share some information. I'm sure you'll like to talk to him. So Mutaz, the difference between the exit criteria and the success criteria are as follows. Exit criteria are the things that need to be completed, the things that need to be done, a checklist of items for you to exit the project, for you to close out the project, for you to come out of the project as it were, which would mean you need to close down the project. So all of those closure procedures, those will be part of the things interwoven with your exit criteria. So in order for you to exit the project, in order for you to close the project, you must have this document, that document, you know, and so on. And some companies, like one of my clients in oil and gas, they've got a very, very elaborate set of exit criteria that shows all the things that have to be done before you exit either a project or phase. And it is very helpful for project managers because, you know, if you have a PMO that has some very specific criteria for you um, to come out of the project, for you to close the project, as a project manager, you want to have those OPAs. You know, whatever those organizational process assets are for you to exit the project, those should be defined in a separate document from success criteria. So what is success criteria, Mutaz? Follow me to, again, that page 81, and let's read what the bullet actually says in total. So I'll just tell you, success criteria are the criteria that need to be met for you to classify the project as a success. Because you do know success is in the eye of the stakeholder. You know that. So if your stakeholder perceives your project to be a failure, trust me, it is a failure. But to help the PM, the stakeholders should agree on what success looks like. And that's why you need the success criteria. What do we need to have present or visible to make the project a success. For some people, it might be on budget, within scope, and on schedule. For some people, it might be fitness for use, conformance to requirements, customer satisfaction, on schedule, within scope, on budget. It, it's many different things. So going back to this page here, it says measurable project objectives, so things that you can measure to make sure the project is hitting the mark. And then it says related success criteria. So the success criteria is that criteria that needs to be present for your project to be classified as a success. I want to show you one more page, Mutaz. So follow me to 4.7. I want to show you 
in 4.7, one important tiny little piece of the puzzle mentioned here. So if we go to 4.7 on page 124, it says the project charter documents the project success criteria the approval requirements and who will sign off on the project. You see that? That's why you need your project charter as an input to close project or phase. That success criteria is pretty important. See? And then if you go through all of the different items to uh, this close project or phase, you see a lot of mention being made, Mutaz, about success and things such as that. Let, let's take a quick read. Let's go to page 123. I just want to show you one tiny bullet point here that is of interest. So right here on page 123 it starts off with with the the activities necessary for the administrative closure of the project or phase include but are not limited to then they begin talking about a bunch of them and then the third bullet and the second sub bullet it says the project manager will be involved in activities to see this audit project success or failure. So how do you know success? It's that criteria, Mutaz. That's why that criteria is very important, the success criteria. Again, the exit criteria, the things that you need to make sure you've done before you close the project, these are talked about on page 123 again, some of the things before you exit. So re reallocation of resources, facilities, equipment, and stuff like that. I'm telling you, there, there's so many avenues and possibilities for questions on the, on the exam that if we were to go into many of these, we, we probably wouldn't get done. But um, does that make sense, Mutaz? I hope that clarifies your question. Okay, so going back to our laundry list of um, information here, I'm going through what we do in the PMBOK guide. I think I'm covering both directions at this rate. So I've talked about develop project charter and I also told you guys that um, the process identify stakeholders should also be done. And then we went over to develop project management plan and I started talking about the project management plan. So the project management plan, I, I sh was showing you an example from the CDC. So if you haven't seen an example of a project management plan, check the chat. I put in a link and this is an example. But I wanted to show you a much more robust example from my friends at the Army Corps of Engineers. And you can see right here, this is a project plan of, <laughs> I don't know if you can see the number of pages, 237 pages for a project management plan for the White River Basin Wide Comprehensive Study. And lots of signatures, lots of information, but what I really like about how they conduct their business is they organize it according to how the universal language from the PMI is. You're welcome, Mutez. So as you can see, we've got the scope of work, we've got the project delivery team, a section for constraints, a section for the WBS, um, acquisition plan also there, uh, quality control plan, which is really like your quality management plan, an analysis of risks. I like this because I almost got my head chewed off by, by a stakeholder that is big on health and safety. <laughs> and if you're in engineering space, you know that the plans in the PMBOK guide, they can be exhausted because you get to the HSE part and health, safety, and environment. And that is not mentioned in the world of the PMI and the whole sustainability thing is not mentioned. So you can, if you will, modify these plans to suit your own condition, right? Change management, communications management, even a value management plan and a closeout plan. So there's a lot of stuff in this document. I mean, 230 something pages. That is a boatload of information. Now, if you do want it, it's public domain. I am just going to type the link in for you. And if you wish to take a look at that, well, feel free to do so. But it's a very, very long link um, from the Army Corps of Engineers. And um, it, it just shows you my, my intention here is to just illustrate to you how the PMBOK guide is taken 
and put into a real world type of manifestation because i know a lot of people read about this stuff but they haven't been asked or made to do these things some companies the pmos will make you i have worked for pmos where they make you do these things it is not optional so if you want to take a look at this massive document you know take a look there and we, we've got all sorts of fancy charts and extracts from uh, the microsoft project or whatever software tool they use to show an activity network diagram so i know a lot of people are like well th these things aren't used in the real world well here's an example for you this is a very robust example you see it's a very robust example so go take a look at that example um, about the project management plan and and that will clear things up for you all right so the project management plan in integration it cuts across everything right and then once you have created your project management plan you then go into execute it you know theoretically speaking now I know there's a lot of overlap you know, if you look at page 555, you see a bunch of overlap within the different process groups. So I'm not saying this is a, a cookie cutter A, B, C, D. No, you could be planning and at the same time you could be involved in conducting procurement. You could be planning and you could be selecting a vendor at the same time. You see, this is where people get hung up. Also, you know, quick trivia for you on, on an exam like the PMP exam, question writers could tell you you are in a particular phase or you're doing a particular thing and then very quickly they shift the camera as it were to focus on something else so your project manager you're closing out a project which document would you refer to to understand historical information about performance on this particular project now if, if you attack that from well I know my ITTO's perspective you may you may actually miss it because the document you go to for certain things may not be listed in the process you are. You enclose project or phase. Does anything prohibit you from referring to the project charter? No. The project charter is an input. Okay. Well, what if I said you are enclosing the project, you're enclosing a phase, and management has asked you to review certain metrics? cost forecast, schedule forecast, and other earned value information. They've also asked you to review part of the TPA, Technical Performance Assessment. Where would you go to for this information? Of course, the answer would be WPR. But do you realize WPR is not an input to close project or phase? So a, a student asked a question a few days ago, and it was a brilliant question because a lot of times what you need to do has nothing to do with the inputs for where you are. So if you're in close project or phase and you need to refer to certain information, certain documentation, certain reports, you need to know that nothing prohibits you from taking a look at that information. Okay, so just keep this in mind to be versatile and on your toes as you get ready for this exam. All right, another big feature in chapter four, after you go through direct and manage uh, project work it is really your um, lessons learned okay your lessons learned is an important feature so I'm just going to show you lessons learned your lessons learned this is a mock-up lessons learned from that same backpack project and this is what my buddy put together one of my colleagues who's a PMP and does question writing with me he's out of Asia but he put this together and again it is fictitious information it's all fictitious but you can see in the lessons learned lessons from scope lessons from quality lessons from risk so on and so forth you know and we've we've been working on this for quite a while so this goes back to four years four years ago I mean that's how crazy it is for me for me to go into this after four years sometimes it just gets crazy I have actually three different examples of projects. One of them is released in a book, and I do recall someone asking for the book. I apologize, I've not gone back to you, but that book is supposed to be on Amazon. Um, it's called The Time Machine Project. So in The Time Machine Project, I show examples of all of these templates. But like I said, you can go to CDC site and get some similar. So if you are in integration, my friends, the lessons learned register is what you create. If I want it to be PMBOK compliant, 
<laughs> I would call it a lessons learned register. And you do know the lessons learned register, um, it becomes part of a lessons learned repository in closing out the project. Okay. So things to things to keep in mind. All right. So your lessons learned register is important. Um, in direct and manage project work, we've got the WPD element coming out. We've got issue log coming out. We've got deliverables coming out. And all of those they kind of speak for themselves okay and this is the lessons learned register now there is a very important part of direct to manage project work that we address one of PMI's holy grail instruments and this holy grail instrument is none other than the change request change requests on your test my friends you really need to buckle down on the, these change requests because the questions could come from a variety of angles. Maybe you got a change request that is premature or you got a verbal change request. What, what do you do if someone sends you a change request and it's incomplete? Do you ever think about that? There needs to be an out for that. You don't keep working on it. You ask for the additional information. You don't just review it and send it off. You also need to think about change requests being issued for stuff that has already been rejected in the past. Now, these questions could be very creative, but if someone is repeatedly asking for a change request, right, a change request for something that you've long since said, this cannot be done on the project, point blank, period, you do need to provide information to that person so they understand, oh, okay, this has been canceled. And it is possible that multiple people are asking for change that you've already dismissed. So you should be ready to face various question types on the exam. I often tell people that what my friends at headquarters are coming out with, a lot of times it's like nothing you've ever seen. Because the people writing these questions, they're grandmasters in these areas. They've worked in these areas. They've gone through real-world scenarios. So if I was going to write you a question from an earned value management perspective, for example, I wouldn't be doing it from PMBOK knowledge or, or head knowledge. I'll be putting you slam dab into a scenario based on my real world, based on what I've experienced with earned value. In the same token, change requests and all these things, when people write these questions, they are being reinforced with real world. And real world is what makes it situational, I'm telling you. The people writing these questions are not, you know, Johnny off the street. That is Johnny that has gone through 20 or 30 years of the school of hard knocks, you know. So going into the PMP exam, I cannot overstate how much you are a project manager in an organization. This happens. What do you do next? This happens with a change request. Someone asks for a verbal change. What do you do? Somebody sends an incomplete change request. What do you do? Or someone requests a change and you review it and you think it should be carried out. But then a particular stakeholder refutes the change request. It could get rather creative. Do you get what I'm saying? So just be ready for that. Um, but one thing I can tell you about change requests for your exam, the best answer to change request questions are usually things that move the change request forward to its ultimate disposition or something that solves the immediate problem or blockage. So if there's a blockage with a change request, it's incomplete, you need to get it complete. If there's a problem with the language, it needs to be corrected. If there is a blockage in understanding, you need to get understanding. You don't just keep reviewing it blindly. So you need to move things along. In fact, for the entire PMP exam, just jot this down as a master key. If the PM is not solving a problem, the PM becomes a problem, and the problem on the exam stays a problem. So in order to move forward on any PMP exam, you need to be solving a problem. Saying no, is that really solving the problem? Or explaining to the stakeholder, is that a better option? Yes, it is. So outright no's and outright rejections and project manager temper tantrums and the project manager asking, oh, the stakeholder, 
boss, may I, may I do this? Just know that those are likely to be wrong answers because a PMI wants you to solve problems like a project manager who is a professional. All right, enough said. So with that said, my friends, about change requests, I want us to um, go to the PMBOK guide because there's something I want to show you. And you already, you've probably heard about it before, but it's the C-A-P-A-D-R and the U factor. I call it the Kappa Drew factor. The Kappa Drew factor is awareness of what exactly is in a change request and the subtle difference of language between what a corrective action would look like, a preventive action would look like, versus a defect repair or an update, page 96. You, you definitely want to read this. So it, it says here, a change request is a formal proposal to modify any document deliverable or baseline. When issues are found while the project is being performed, change requests can be submitted which may modify project policies or procedures project or product scope, project cost or budget, project schedule or quality of the project or product results. And it goes on and on and on. And then it says change requests may include, this is the final line, corrective action, preventive action, defect repair updates. Corrective action, what is that? Intentional activity that realigns the performance of the project work with the project management plan. You see that? The key word, hey, if you've got your PMBOK guide open, you need to be highlighting these key words, my friends. Where's your highlighter? I've shown you many PMBOK guides. You need to be highlighting this thing up, putting a piece of paper in between, using markers, anything to keep track of this stuff. But there's a difference between realign versus ensuring. So corrective action realigns the project performance, right? Performance of the project work. Preventive action, the key word here is ensures alignment. There's a difference between realigning versus ensuring alignment right from the beginning. Preventive action ensures alignment. Corrective action realigns. And then we've got defect repair. In defect repair, there's no realigning. There's no aligning. Too late. You've gone down a dark alley. Now you've got a defect. So it's an intentional activity to modify a non-conforming product or product component. Now you... you you need to be aware of, of trick questions. I'm, I'm just dropping gold for you here tonight. But there are trick questions that would say the cost of performing defect repair is greater than the cost of what? What we just read, prevention and correction. So defect repair costs more than prevention. Is that true? Defect repair costs more than correction. Is that true? No. These are big, bogus, blanket statements. Big, bogus, blanket statements. That's what they are. Triple Bs and an S. They're all bogus because on the exam, do not be surprised when you find questions that say, all project managers should do this. Usually a big, fat lie. All projects have this. Usually a lie. So anytime you've got the words always, never, and things like that, you know that they are bogus. They are taking you down a dark alley. You don't want to be in a dark alley. All right. Okay, my friends, any questions about what we've talked about so far? Or any questions about the project management training courses that are available to you on praiseyon.com? Questions? All right. You guys are gurus. You got no questions. You know about the Kappa Drew factor. Very good. Just be on the lookout for red herrings because they do exist. All right. So with that said, we've taken a look at the project charter, the project management plan, change requests, lessons learned. And of course, you do know that when you are exiting a project, going back to the great question from Mutaz, the exit criteria, part of your exit criteria, it could be to have some sort of document. So keep that in mind, like a final report. If that is part of your exit criteria, you need to deliver a final report. Let's take a read right here, 4.7, and we are looking at the outputs. Final report on page 127. A final report provides a summary of project performance. It can include 
summary level description of the project or phase summary objectives and if the criteria was met quality objectives right and if there were variances reasons for that cost objectives any reasons for variances in cost summary of the validation information of the final product service or result schedule objectives summary of how the final product service or result achieve the business needs identified in the business plan and summary of any risks so you can see that closing out a project from this process close project or phase is very involved there's so much information in it so much information but that's that for integration now I'm gonna move into another area another knowledge area we're talking about scope management so Scope management, of course, starts off with a scope management plan. You do know that. And the requirements management plan that set the pace and the tone for how the requirements will be elicited and how scope will be managed on the project. You do already know that. Now, when all that is done and you have used a requirements traceability matrix, hopefully, to collect requirements, if that's the kind of thing your uh, project thrives on, a requirements traceability matrix, maybe requirements documentation. You move on to your WBS, but I'm going to show you a few things from scope just really quick here. So you would have your RTM, your requirements traceability matrix. As you can see, it maps requirements to their origin and lots of other associated variables. Again, it's a fictitious document. so. Don't get hung up on any of the information that I'm showing you here, all right? So that's uh, your requirements traceability matrix, or RTM. Still in this space of collecting requirements, we have something known as a requirement documentation, or requirements documentation, and it would look something like this. So there is your requirements documentation, or a requirement document, I, I mean. So your requirements documentation could look like this, or it could just be more like text in a document. But there's a key definition that the PMI tells you in the PMBOK guide, and that is that the requirement documentation, as you can see it's requirement documentation, it describes how the requirements meet the business need. So just things to think about in scope. But that, that is what that could look like. In addition to that, in scope management, you also have a project scope statement. It's a very important document, and it's part of what makes up the scope baseline. So let me open it in Excel just to show it to you again. Project scope statement, and there it is. And your project scope statement, again, it's one of these narrative documents. It's, it's text heavy in, in many instances, but um, what it really does for you is it outlines the exclusions, the acceptance criteria, and it revisits. It revisits the constraints and assumptions to make sure they are exactly what they should be that they are correct okay again the CDC has got you know similar documents so just go onto the CDC website and take a look at it so it goes into a lot of detail you do a product analysis so on and so forth okay so I, I hope this stuff is making sense so that is scope management for you um, in a previous episode I showed you guys the scope tool for WBS creation. I don't know if you checked it out, but I'll show it to you again. Here it is. It's called WBSTool.com. And in WBSTool.com, you've got a tool to make a WBS. So let's make a new WBS. And you can alter You can alter what you've got in there, you know, by adding different elements. You can make them siblings or you can make them children. So if I wanted to add a bunch of children to this, I'll click on it and add my 
my different process groups. And this stuff, of course, you know, it just helps you organize your project, keep it straight. See that? And it's free, which is cool. So that's a, a begin of a WBS and of course you would populate it with information under it so on and so forth that is one tool I would recommend that you use um, to develop a WBS if you need one or you might use good old PowerPoint or Visio uh, when you are done with the WBS um, don't forget your WBS dictionary so in this example I'm showing you it's a WBS dictionary again it's the fictitious project so I get emails from people saying, oh, but but it's fictitious. Forget about anything that is in here that may not align with what you've seen in the past. I want you guys to go just play around and, and f just have a visual of this thing so you understand it. To be perfectly honest with you, there was only one project that I saw a really, really massive WBS dictionary being lugged around by one of the master planners of that project and it was a government project name withheld but it, it it was a very substantial WBS dictionary the poor guy was almost shuffling as it was he carried this big binder full of eight and a half by elevens eight and a half by elevens just for like an eternity of of pages all just strewn together and he asked me if I wanted to see it and I'm, I'm like no thank you because it was just too big so on, on this project, he had many, 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 I'm talking about going to 20,000 elements, all described in detail. Can you imagine that? But I don't see that happening on every project. Some projects do not have WBSs, let alone a dictionary. While I believe that every project should, to some degree, have some sort of WBS, I can understand if some people don't. Because some projects are very routine, they're very repetitive, and um, it would make sense to just have a standard WBS as part of your standard operating procedures for people to take a look at. So if you don't have a WBS, I'm not going to beat you over the head, but I would say have a standard one in your company for these break-fix projects or repeat-type projects. It just helps everyone be on the same page. Okay. Now, you do know that the WBS is not the major output named from Create WBS. It is, of course, the scope baseline. All right, at this point, my friends, do you have any concerns or questions? I can see our project management guru, Robert, has checked in. Robert, it's always a pleasure to see you online. I hope you're doing well. And I hope um, project management is still your friend <laughs> because you've been doing this for eons, Robert. So uh, are you and, and project management still in a in a very good associative uh, relationship or have you have you sacked project management for good <laughs> tell me Robert I know all this stuff is right down your alley it's stuff you've seen maybe you don't care to see no more some people have had enough with project management they're like I just want to just want to retire Phil and there are many gurus like that many of the old gurus that we've seen I'm not saying you're old but of course not <laughs> but Many of the gurus from time past who were there, like right back when NASA and the DOD were doing all this stuff, many of those guys, they don't want to do project management no more. Like one of my clients has been doing this stuff for going to 40 years, and he, he said, that's it, Phil. I ain't getting certified no more. This PMP thing, I'm just going to go enjoy myself in Cabo. And that's that's what he's doing. He's chilling in Mexico somewhere, a little island somewhere. I don't know where wherever he is, but not everyone wants to continue this, like you know, for more than twenty, thirty years. But I know there's some anomalies. <laughs> Maybe my mind will change tomorrow. Maybe I'm like, I've had it. I've had it. See ya. <laughs> you know, and project management is a very involved profession. Um, it does take a lot of keeping up with the time of project management. 
you know, just taking a look at all of the tools that they're coming out with these days, there's so many project management tools, and they are very, very, like, agile in, in nature. And to keep up with them, you've got to be on your toes. You really do. But anyway, thanks for dropping by, Robert. Really appreciate it. Appreciate your support. And um, you, you checking in. So we, we've talked about the WBS and scope management. But I think we should change gears here, my friends. And I think we should go into some, some a bit of uh, schedule management. Schedule management. So uh, le let's, let's lay the foundation for what happens in schedule management. In schedule management, the first thing that happens is you want to plan schedule management, right? You want to plan how are we going to develop the schedule, how are we going to manage the schedule, what is it going to look like, who are our collaborators as we put this schedule together, and what kind of relationships are we going to use? Finish to finish, uh, start to finish. You know, you know, some projects they they tell you don't use a, a a finish to finish, don't use a start to finish. Just use start to start, finish to start. Those are the approved relationships in our organization. That sounds very 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 strange. <laughs> it does. It sounds very strange. Robert, my friend, thank you. I know you're in the flow. You're always in the zone, Robert. You are. You you were there right from the beginning when project management was what it should be. These days, we've got all sorts of caricatures of, of, of project management. Sometimes, you know, I mean, don't let, don't let me get, hey, you're aggravating me, Robert. You're making me say things I don't want to. <laughs> You, but you know what I'm talking about, Robert. Let's be honest. Project management has changed. It, it has. And a lot of folks are not keeping it real with project management. They want an easy way out. I mean, they, they want to, as it were, put the crown on, on top of every single character, whether they know project management or not. I, I see a lot of danger in, in time to come in this profession because... People don't want, they don't want to go the full, the full mile. They just want to jump out halfway and say they're project manager. I really see things going, you know, go, going a little bit to, to that dark side that, that, that no one wants to talk about, you know, because these days nobody wants to, nobody wants to do the hard work, you know. You, you know what puzzles me about a lot of folks? They think that agile is a cop out. They think, you know, I was training project management to a firm, and the moment I trained a little bit of the agile, <laughs> one of the one of the attendees just got up and said, "I love this! I love this!" And his reason for loving it was not what you think. It was because he thought he had to do a lot less work. But do you know that the people part of the puzzle of project management is a lot of work? The people piece, the executing. You know, on your PMP exam. But anyway, let me get off my soapbox. Let me go to a section that um, is very interesting. Robert, I'm sure you will agree with me that the mysteries of scheduling are very, very intriguing. So talking about scheduling in the world of the PMI, you know, they don't have any particular tool that they, they tell you you must use. You know, they don't make you use any particular tool. But Microsoft Project is a friend, a blast from the past that um, I used every day. I mean, it, it was a daily grind in MS Project and Project Server. So I'm quite familiar with the tool. But the thing I like about Microsoft Project is it enables you to see the data in a variety of ways. The Gantt chart, or if you want a more tabular view, or if you just want to keep your eyes on the predecessors, or the cost, as you can see, my buddy has put in some cost here. Um, or resources. So, Robert, this this must be a blast from the past. I'm I'm sure you used a lot of scheduling tools back in the day, but this is MS Project. Um, the actual MS Project 365 offering is is going to change, and you'll be. I don't know. For those of you diehards may not be very amused at what MS Project is going to become. Um, and some of you might say, no, change is good. I guess it's all relative. But I like how they're going to be giving you the options of customizing it to, to meet your needs and, and do whatever you want. But anyway, this is um, a schedule. And as you can see, 
the different relationship types. So new project. So those of you who are new to MS project, I would advise that you get some training on it. It's very, very, very important for your project management. In my opinion, um, the door for project management was open to me, um, on a more professional level because I knew Microsoft project and I was employed by an engineering firm to do it, to manage a, a very huge set of schedules for a program of projects. And it was very, very helpful in framing my perspective of project management. So if you haven't used a scheduling tool like P6 or MS project, or I don't know, even smart sheets, you know, I'll give smart sheets a pass, you know, it's visual, you can do a lot of things with it. But if you haven't used a scheduling tool, I want to I want to advise you to. So going back to the exam, you will, of course, be tested on minutia in some instances regarding relationships. Predecessor of task two is task one. And you can see that right over there. I'm going to zoom into this screen because I, I want you to take a look at these relationships. So let's zoom in a little bit here, just a tiny little bit. Here is a finish to start relationship right here. Now this finish to start relationship, we could add some additional criteria to it by putting some lag in there. So if we add two days, it's a bit grumpy, 2D, two days. Uh-oh, doesn't like that. What am I doing wrong? Um, type only positive hold numbers. Okay. <laughs> One. I might have forgotten how to do this. Oh, finish to start. One, is it FS? There we go. You have to type in the finish to start or he doesn't like it. Okay. So... This is really saying task one, finish to start, and two days. But in the same token, we can have a task three, which is a uh, task one, a finish to start, and or a start to start, and five days, um, five days lag. So you can see these relationship types that you get on the questions you can actually go into the software and see how they look, see how they are. And the durations are different. We can have different durations, which of course is different from the lag or the slack or the float. And that's why I tell people, if you haven't played with one of these, you're missing out on some of the fun of project management. You know, let's do a three finish to start and Today, so you can see this is a task three predecessor with a two-day lag. You can see that it has moved in. Oh, I'm sorry, you cannot see my screen very well. Let me revert. Okay, so this will help you see things a little bit better. I apologize. Let me take myself out of the shot for the meantime. So if you take a close look, you can see what I was doing over there. You can see this is a finish to start relationship with two days of lag. You can see this is a start to start relationship with five days of lag. And you can see this is a finish to start relationship, but with two days of lead, minus for lead, plus for lag. Okay, that kind of thing. I guess some of you are not strangers to this, which is awesome. Okay. I see our friend Crumsy Crumsy is here. Hope you're doing well. Welcome to our discussion about the PMBOK guide and tips and tricks to be ready for the exam. So for your exam, you know, you need to be aware of the different relationship types. And then you also need to be aware of dependencies. Mandatory, discretionary, internal, external, mandatory, um, hard logic, um, discretionary soft logic or preferred logic or preferential logic. 
There are a lot of terms and things to be aware of. You know, and then when we talk about the resources that we assign to these tasks, you need to be aware that there's a tight link between resource management and, and schedule management. In fact, before there was there was a, there was no resource management, it was human resource management and the resources were estimated in scheduling. But now we estimate the resources in resource management, we bring in stuff from there in here to use. Okay. So you're getting ready for the exam on the fourteenth. You know you're gonna kill it. You know you're going to crush it. I look forward to hearing good news of your success. And um, just keep doing all that I ask you to do. Watch my one day to PMP exam video, my two day to PMP exam video. And I think I've got a three day to PMP exam video. Just make sure you do all those things before the D-Day. So going back to schedule management, my friends, you know, developing the schedule, it has to do with ensuring that the resources are really available when you said they'd be you know when when you said they'd be and, and really making sure that you've got the people that you're you're putting the schedules duration your the schedule duration hinges on on these resources Phil James and Mary well if if one of them isn't available your schedule could go downhill so you need to you need to remember that I know you're all over it very good very, very good. I just shared news earlier about Bill, one of my students, and Bill went through the process and did everything he should. And today he sent me an email. I didn't even know he was taking the exam. A lot of my students like taking the exam without Phil knowing. <laughs> so I appreciate you sharing with me. But, you know, I think they don't let me know because some of them are nervous. But obviously you are not. I can tell you are not nervous. All right, so um, still in regards to the exam, when it comes to develop schedule and control schedule, you guys need to be aware of the resource leveling clauses there and resource smoothing. And you do know that these functions exist in, in Microsoft Project. Now, I haven't really built a very good schedule here, but the ability to level, it does exist in one of these one of these um, fields here. Those of you who are into it would know where to find the uh, resource leveling uh, tool. There's a very evil tool known as resource leveling and it exists right here in project and I'm glad I can't find it. I'm glad I can't. But anyway, going to other views in project, you've got a network diagram view so you can see the network diagram of what I just developed and then you can see other views. There are many, many other views and Microsoft Projects is just an all-round great tool for project managers to use. Even if you're not going to use it like on every single project, I would highly advise it because it will make you sharp in the area of scheduling. You see the leads and lags are very, very visual. Um, putting resources in so that you can see the impact of certain skilled resources being added. All of that stuff, can it can all be orchestrated to be very vivid in MS Project. All right, so with that said, in the area of scheduling, you know there's a lot of information here, so much stuff. If we go into the scheduling aspect, we talk about these activity attributes, so take a look there at the screen. Activity attributes, let me get myself out of the way. I apologize for being in the way here. That is an example of activity attributes, metadata. One of my students, Norm, out in NASA, he said, Phil, this is activity metadata. I said, you're correct. I'm going to borrow that term. So this is activity metadata. It describes each of the activities in detail and tells you pretty much what each activity is about. You can also have responsibility information, location information, activity type, so much stuff. And you see all of that there. Okay, so that's your activity attributes. You also, from this knowledge area, get what we call an activity list, which I am showing you here as well. So you can see that there. Okay. So I'm curious, Robert, have you ever seen all of this stuff being used on, on a project? 
like the way the PMI say? I'm curious. I've used Smart Cheese Primavera HPPM. What is HPPM? High Performance Project Management? <laughs> I don't know. Tell me. I don't know. Um, yes, and none as popular as MS Project. That is true. That is correct. Absolutely. Yeah. So activity list, you can see a list of activities. That's It's just a plain list of activities. So this stuff that they talk about here, activity attributes, activity list, milestone list, they are worthy of imagining. And this is an example of the list of activities. And, you know, the description of what exactly each one is. Um, this would be more done in the um, activity attribute section. Um, but what some people would do is copy a description of the activity. And right there in their schedule, they just add some information here. in this note section about the activity. And there it shows you the note icon to remind you, oh, there's a note here. So you can see the notes, the process of conducting market research, blah, blah, blah. You don't always have to put that right there in the poor task name. The task name should be as short as possible, right? But additional information could be right in there. You know, the resources will be shown, but the notes field especially could be very useful to you as a project manager. All right. So that's um, the activity list. And last but not least, in Chapter 6, we have got milestone list. So milestone list is a list of milestones. As you can see here, I've got a list of milestones. Um, and milestones, as you know, they're key events. So we've got dates there for these key events. But as a project manager, you should um, know about these key events happening on your project. And you should be able to display this to your project uh, team, your stakeholders, and people such as that. All right. So at this point, questions, my friends, on anything relating to what I have talked about tonight. We covered integration, we talked about scope, we talked about schedule. I'm just curious to know if you've got any questions for me about any of these topics, or maybe they're concerns. Have you heard anything untoward about the exam that, like, Phil, this is what I heard. I don't know what my fate is going to be. You got any questions like that? Because, I, I mean, I can tell you that what you should be thinking about is 2020. 2020 is... is there's some really heavy, heavy changes that are going to be happening for the PMP exam in 2020. Now, I know some of you, you already know about these changes. And I'm not just talking about the exam, but I'm talking about monumental changes that will be more of a paradigm shift for the PMP exam. But you hear it from me probably later next year, but not right now. But one thing I can tell you, my friends, the handwriting is on the wall that if you really want to get certified because of the variability that is approaching, you probably want to do it like yesterday. Trust me, you want to get certified, go into your time machine and do it yesterday because <laughs> that, is, that is what's going to happen. The exam is gonna it's gonna have some variability in there. There are always unknowns. You know, whenever the exam changes in a monumental way, there are unknowns. And those unknowns they can sometimes overtake you in emergent ways, ways you never even imagined. So uh please be aware of that. Okay? Be aware of that. So in closing, I'll just talk about a few of my uh, favorite aspects of Chapter 5. There's a lot of things in Chapter 5 to be aware of. Um, the tools and techniques of um, collecting requirements, you definitely need to look out for that. There's a lot of stuff there, a boatload of stuff there. So I'm I'm just going to hit those real quick here, and um, I'll get off my soapbox after that. But um, 
talking about collecting requirements as you can see on the screen we have the basic inputs tools and techniques and outputs so let, let's hone in on these tools and techniques I want to point something out here taking a look at the tools and techniques of collect requirements they look a little bit too innocent they're a lot worse than they actually look so data gathering we'll take a look at that in more detail data analysis we'll take a look at that um, decision making we'll take a look at that but what are these three first of all if you're collecting requirements or eliciting requirements you are gathering data keep that in mind first secondly if you gather that data you need to analyze the data to decide hmm which of these requirements has a high risk about it which of these requirements is absolutely necessary non-negotiable and stuff like that which of these requirements can tank the project these are questions that need to be asked from a knowledge area wide perspective decision making you need to make decisions on these requirements whether to go ahead with them or not to okay and your perspective to those requirements data representation can be used to put all of this information about requirements together into a visual map so that you understand how the requirements are interwoven and things such as that we use interpersonal and team skills because there's lots of meetings happening and those meetings to collect requirements elicit requirements we need our team skills to be able to you know interact with team members and create a safe space and things like that context diagrams these pretty much show you how data flows into a system and out of the system and how it interacts with the environment and actors who are people and entities interacting with the system and then prototypes these are ways you can collect early feedback by showing mock-up representations of either the flow or maybe even an early version of a product prototypes now on the surface these look friendly and and not as foreboding as dun 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 help <laughs> where did all my space go in the tools and techniques column <laughs> so if you take a look at this tools and techniques section it's like what from one line in data gathering to one two three four five lines you kidding me from one in decision making to two <laughs> and so on and so forth so I'm showing you all of this my friends to just sensitize you to what is under the hood like brainstorming interviews focus groups questions and surveys benchmarking you gotta be familiar with those in data gathering decision making same things so it, it's easy to look at an image such as the one I just showed you on the previous slide and say oh yeah I know what these are and then you you get to this and you're like what and that is why I tell people cramming the tools techniques inputs and outputs is foolishness why would you cram all of this so what are you cramming in it that brainstorming is used here isn't it obvious that brainstorming is used here isn't it obvious that a focus group should be called for product service or result when you're collecting requirements you, you need to make these things stick by asking the why. why why am I using brainstorming here and how am I using brainstorming here and why am I using an affinity diagram what is an affinity diagram what does it look like and then you go to the next step and you take a look at the thing I've told you you could go to asq.org to look for great examples the PMI doesn't give you very many in the PMBOK guide of all these ITTOs so you gotta go hunt my friend you gotta go hunting for these ITTOs and part of the, the territory you can hunt on is ASQ.org so go to ASQ.org and look for example so I didn't get this from there but it's an example of an affinity diagram a business tool used to organize that's the key thing so if someone says you're organizing brainstormed ideas that should be immediately a signal to you what you're doing oh that's an affinity diagram you see what I'm saying so if we go back to collect requirements where we were a few seconds ago collect requirements where are you 
collect requirements has gone into hiding. Okay, there it is. So as you go through these things, just ask yourself, okay, how is it used? Why is it used? How is it used? Why is it here? What does it look like? You know, another example is context diagrams. And these are some examples that were readily available, taking a look at Wikipedia and so on. There's the Swish Swash Windshield Wiper Company example. And there's also an example about a drive through to order burgers or whatever it is. Um, this The one in this case is actually different. This one is um, an order system for a bank. So bank deposit information gets pushed out. A warehouse sends completed orders into the order system and it spits stuff out to the sales rep and accounting. This is what a context diagram is. So if, if you've read about it and you've not seen it and you're not making an attempt to before you exam, you're doing the wrong thing, my friend. You do need to see these examples. All right. So when I talk about the inputs, tools and techniques and outputs of the PMBOK guide, you just have to practicalize them. You have to make them realistic to you. Things like a requirements traceability matrix. Take a look at one. What does it look like? What are the fields? Can you imagine how this will be used on a project? And things such as that. These are things I expect you to do. Okay? Very good. Cheap questions before we jump off the call. You're creating a WBS. WBS. What is the output of your efforts? You are creating a WBS. What is the output of your efforts? Let's take Phil out of this. He's, he's been a bit bothersome, wouldn't you agree? Blocking everyone's view. There we go. Any any ideas for the answer? You are creating a WBS. What do you get out of it? I only hear crickets. My East Coasters have gone to bed. Hey, Robert chatted into us. Robert says, I'm still learning. To answer your question, no, we used MISD67. Robert, what is that? I'm going to have to go Google it. <laughs> I got no idea what it is. Uh-oh. United States District Courts. Sentences imposed chart. I know that's not what you're talking about. Oh, my goodness. I know that's not what you're talking about, Robert. What is MISD 67? Please educate me, my learned colleague. I have got not the slightest idea, Robert. Oh, you repeated your schedule grids. Wow. On vellum sheets. You kept several drafts. Oh. Huh. Kept several drafts men busy. That was the days of having to do everything by hand. My goodness. <laughs> EVM was an anathema to most practitioners. Oh, why did you mention EVM? Now you're, you're, you're making me want to talk about it. You're making me want to talk about it. Um, I'm, I might have to bring it up. Okay, everybody knows this cheap question is, of course, the scope baseline. Well done, my friends. That is the answer to this one. I, I want people to go to bed happy. <laughs> I'm not going to show you my, my repository of miserable questions. That wouldn't be good. Here's another one. You're in the process of creating a document that specifies inclusions exclusions and the deliverable description this describes what so thank you for those of you who chatted the answer in Dilpreet thank you very much DZ Algeria if you're out of Algeria good morning to you thank you for joining us Crumsy Crumsy says in develop project charter inputs Agreements. Are these mostly OPAs? 
or should we expect these inputs to come from stakeholders or pre-project work? That is a great question. I will be answering that. <laughs> okay. So, um, the answer to this one is what? You are on your A game. That is correct, Crumsy Crumsy. It is indeed defined scope. Thank you, Dilpreet. It is indeed defined scope. You guys are in the zone. Easy peasy for you. Very good. It is defined scope. Well done. All right. So Bob has inspired me to get to chapter six. Oh, dear. What have we here? Fill the PMP junkie. All right. Identify risks, plan risk responses, planning, or perform quantitative risk analysis. What are you doing here? Read the question. Supply me an answer. Thank you very much. What do you think? Thank you very much for your chats, and I'm glad you could join me, my friend from Algeria, if you are really in Algeria. My goodness, it is early over there. It's probably like, what, two or three in the morning? Well done, I'm burning the midnight oil to get this PMP exam sorted. Great job. Okay, Dilpreet has typed in the answer has been planning. Why is the answer planning? Because it's asking for a process group, not for a process. You guys are good. You got that one right. Very, very good. All right, let's go for one more cheap question here. You're in the process of discussing with your project team to decide which approach is best to collect requirements. You decide to use a combination of methods along with focus groups. The output of this process is what? Uh-oh, he's pointing a finger. I think he's trying to warn you about something. Let me get that fill out of the way. He's causing trouble again. Again. Causing trouble. Let's get him out of the way. All right. Any answers? We'll leave on a high note. <laughs> wow, it's 4.30 a.m. My goodness. Well, thank you, DZ Jerry. Appreciate it. Questions or answers to 12? Do you have a follow-on question for me, or do you have an answer for me? Number 12. Number 12. 12 answers thank you any other answers thank you very much any other answers going once going twice thank you very much for all of your answers crumbsy crumbsy thank you very much all right. Well, the answer to this, my friends, you are very, very good in guessing it is requirements traceability matrix. However, I am happy to inform you that that is not the answer. So we're going to read the question one more time, and I will tell you why the answer is not B. What does it tell you you are doing? You are in the process of what? Discussing with your project team to decide which approach is best. Which approach is best to collect requirements? Let's decide it in this process right here. Which process is that? You decide to use prototyping. In which process did you decide we're going to use prototypes? In which process did you decide we're going to use this? In which process did you decide, okay, you know what? We're going to use 
facilitated workshops, focus groups, questionnaires and surveys, and we'll also throw in a little bit of context diagrams. Which process were you in when you decided that? Which process were you in? You are discussing with your project team to decide. Where do you decide, we're going to do this, 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 we're going to do that, 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 and that. In which process? Think about it. Think about it. In the world of the PMI, you are always in plan X management when you are deciding how to do something, what to do. You are absolutely correct, crumbsy crumbsy. The answer is D. Scope management plan, because you are actually in plan scope management. So this question leads you down an alley, as they always try to do, to take you off the road, to try and do bad things, <laughs> to try and get you out of the world of the PMI into some strange world. But you guys, you now know why the answer is D. Awesome. Now, to close, we're just going to take a step further and talk about this topic of earned value. But the thing about earned value is once I start going down the earned value path, I never get out on time. So what I'm going to do is just show you an idea of earned value. Maybe that will suffice for tonight because I really don't want to take you guys too far. I have a tendency of just going too far when it comes to earned value. And you know what? I also do need to remember what the grapeviners have been saying over the past number of weeks. I can't believe I didn't even get one question on TCPI. Well, who knows? You might be the lucky one too, even though everyone says I didn't get a question on this or that. You might be the fortunate one too. Okay. So, I want to show you a very practical illustration of earned value which was shared by a project manager on the web very generously you don't often find sheets like this but um, a huge shout out to the PM who shared this earned value uh, template um, freely and um, this earned value template it can be used to show project managers the pragmatic feel um, that earn value can have. I have um, seen a lot of earn value um, protesters, I will call them. People who are not very keen on earn value, they think it's bogus and it's, it's not helpful. But I beg to differ because I have seen and used it myself. So this is the sheet that I'm talking about, and to the PM who shared this, thank you very much. But if you take a look at this um, sheet here, we can see how these earned value graphs can be formed with real data. Where is the data coming from? You can see the different time periods. So let's say we got 12 months on this project. You can see how the data for the earned value is you know this is what is planned it says plan value or budgeted cost of work scheduled BCWS so I know Bob this these four acronym earned value names you probably are right down the alley of comfort with these but anyway we can see the planned value okay so there are two things to look out for when you talk about earned value here and I'm just going to use um, a highlighter to highlight these for you. Whenever you look at earned value in the real world, you need to be observant of the current earned value being reported. So if we take a look at the current you know, earned value for that month, we can see it here as 525 for month one. But then we can see that the cumulative plan value is a thousand because that's what is planned for month one. So month one, we can see a thousand dollars plan value 
$525 earn value and then actual cost I'll make that blue see that 800 actual cost so that should immediately tell you wow we planned to get a thousand dollars worth of work done but we only got five hundred twenty five dollars worth of work done and guess how much we spent absolutely horrendous eight hundred dollars we spent eight hundred dollars to get five hundred dollars worth of work done so that is how you need to just practically look at this stuff in a pragmatic fashion and if we go to the actual graph for this thing if we go to the graph up here you can see these points plotted so if you hover over it you can see that the red is actually 800 because that's actual cost the earned value is 525 if we could hover over it closely enough um, I don't think it will let me and then oh there we are earned value you see that 525 that point is 525 and then the blue um, for the plan value what did we plan to do a thousand dollars see and that is how this stuff is used in a pragmatic way and when you take a look at this over a period of 12 months for 12 months project what do you see you can see all the values for cumulative actual cost you can see all the values for the cumulative earn value or BCWP if you will and then you just take these numbers we don't have numbers for month 8 to 12 but you can see we have for month 1 to 7 and these are plotted so on your PMP exam if you get questions that ask you let me show you something see if I can get a shape I get a shape here shape no I don't think I can alright but I know they exist here um, but if if I was to mark let's say month 5 and I said what is the state of the project at month 5 because you know that earn value is green take a closer look because you know earn value is green anytime earn value is under you are in a bad position anytime earn value shows it's under you know, earn values under actual cost, bad. Earn values under plan value, bad. Earn value is above both of these, good. See? So, if earn value is under in any graph, bad. If earn value is above one but under another, it may be good from one perspective but bad in another perspective. So let me show you here, for example, month four, right? If you take a look at this, the earn value is greater than the actual cost, which means you spent the red 6550, but you gained 7820. So you gained more than what you paid. That's good. You see? Green, you gain more than what you pay. That's good. The blue, however, this shows you 9200. You planned to do $9,200, but you only did $7,820. You see. So at different points on a project, you, you could have different earn value snapshots. Your earn value snapshot at month four is different at month five. Month five, you're now, you're now over budget. You see. So just taking a look at this green line, if I can make this bigger for you taking a look at the green line month one you, I mean if you can't really see it too well but you begin to see how things are unfolding very clearly at month four month four you are under budget but behind schedule month five you are under budget no you're over budget I beg your pardon and you are behind schedule month six you are under budget but behind schedule Num uh, number seven, month seven, you are ahead of schedule and under budget. So it, it takes time uh, to really understand these earned value tricks. And I would say watch all the videos that I've got out. They've got a lot of videos on earned value. I've got so many videos, it's ridiculous. It's one of the topics that I, I thoroughly enjoy 
um, having seen it being used and the value of it, you know. And then we've got all sorts of reports that we could create for earned value. It is a very, very good tool, especially on large projects um, where the stakes are high. Some of my clients actually use resource hours instead of money to track their projects using earned value metrics. And that is a whole different discussion. But my friends, I hope you found use from this session. It is not very often that we're able to have these live, but I am glad that those of you who were able to join did join. And thank you very much for your contributions. Really appreciate you contributing and, and sharing ideas. And Robert, thank you very much for chatting in and exposing us to some of the things that happened way back when. Really appreciate it. Okay. So thank you very much, my friend DZ Algeria. Please send any message to the support email, support at praiseon.com. That is the best email to use. Someone on my team will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, for anyone who may have tried to send me personal messages, one-on-one -on -one messages, um, I do apologize, but I get hundreds of messages. A lot of times stuff falls to the bottom of my email. I think right now I've got like 600 emails to go through. So um, nothing personal, but um, just prefer you send it to that email so someone on my team can get back to you as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, Crumzy, our friend here, says, don't forget this one, Phil, in Develop Project Charter Input. Oh! <laughs> Yes, thank you very much for reminding me about that. Agreements. Are these mostly OPAs or should we expect these inputs to come from stakeholders? Very good question. So, I like whiteboarding stuff. I wish I could whiteboard everything. I wish I could whiteboard the entire PMBOK guide. It would, it would help some people. <laughs> but I want to address agreements and it does need a little bit of discussion. So, let me... Let me bring up a blank slide for us to share some ideas here. And that will be the final thing we talk about. Okay. So agreement. And the question is, are these mostly OPAs or should we expect these inputs to come from stakeholders or pre-project work? I will try not to be too indulgent in answering this question, but I like the question. But I need to make sure I don't go overboard because this could actually be a very long discussion. So I will try to keep it within sensible limits. All right. So first of all, these agreements being spoken about are not OPAs at all. We don't want to look at these as OPAs because what are OPAs, processes and procedures, and the corporate knowledge base, right? So we don't exactly, let me get myself out of the way, I apologize. Always in the way. Get him out of the way, would you? Get him out of the way. Thank you. All right. So these agreements. They are actually from your perspective, perspective I should say, oh, let me not say perspective. Let's say, let's just say client, and I'm going to explain the different facets of these agreements. So follow me. I told you I didn't want to go off on a rabbit trail, but it does require some explaining, a little bit of explaining. So if you take a look at page 78, let's read. Agreements are used to define initial intentions for a project. Agreements may take the form of contracts between you and your client, memorandums of understanding, MOUs, service level agreements, SLAs, letters of agreement, letters of intent, 
verbal agreement or other written agreement. Watch this. Typically, a contract is used when a project is being performed for an external customer. So what are they really saying here? If you have an external customer, you would use a contract. But imagine working for a firm and you have a work order, which is really code for a project in some firms, but you have a work order to carry out some sort of work for a sister department. You could have SLAs that govern that relationship. It's an agreement, right? It's a, a scope of work, a piece of the work, and how you should deliver it to a particular standard. Memorandums of understanding, MOUs, think about it. There could be an MOU between you and a client, and while they haven't given you a, a full-blown contract just yet, they've got an MOU to you or an LOI to you, right? But ultimately, the hope is there will be some sort of purchase order, some sort of contract, some sort of understanding for both parties. Now, in the same token, for your sellers, people who you're selling to, those folks, if you issued an LOI, a letter of intent, for you to do business with them, that could be a precursor to them creating a suite of documents, a suite of outputs for this hopeful project. So from your perspective, you would see the agreements between you and the client. From your subordinates, or I should say from your vendor's perspectives, you would see this as maybe a document between them and you agreeing on the way forward. And these things could be used to develop your charter. Because one of the things in the charter, and I actually meant to show this while I was showing the charter in the Excel file, but I was talking about so many things all at once, I ended up not doing that. But one of the things that I wanted to show you, if I can get it open again, was the stakeholder list. You can see here, stakeholder list. I want to show you key stakeholder list. The key stakeholder list is not the stakeholder register. So your contract, you see what I'm saying, can fuel your stakeholder list because part of your stakeholder list could be those people who are working for you. You see that? And their stakeholders. So this is on page 81 and you want to look for the uh, key stakeholder list because some of the information that makes its way into this list are people who are vendors, entities who are suppliers and things like that. Okay, so I hope that um, explains. Now in the same token, oh you're good, That it's a good, good question. OPAs, processes and procedures and the corporate knowledge base, that does not have your current contracts in it. It could have historical information about projects, what transpired, and things such as that. But if you follow me to page 79 of the PMBOK guide real quick here, page 79 it says, OPAs at the top. The OPAs that can influence developed project charter are organizational standard policies, governance frameworks, I'm paraphrasing here, monitoring and reporting methods, templates, and historical, you see that? Lessons learned and the lessons learned repository, project records and documents, information about the results of previous project selection decisions, and information about previous project performance. Now, to crave your indulgence a little bit more, if you go to chapter one, actually chapter two, I beg your pardon, chapter two and page, let's go to page 40, 41, and so on. If you go to page 40, you are correct in talking about certain procurement oriented or sounding language. If you take a look at the last bullet under initiating and planning, it says pre-approved supplier lists. 
and various types of contractual agreements. But here, they're actually talking about different models and different methods that you could use to put an agreement in place. Fixed price, cost reimbursable time, material, hybrid, whatever it is. They're giving you some ideas of how this could look, but it's still processes and procedures for conducting work. So you thinking about contracts is not an it's not an entirely bad idea. It's just that right here we have guidelines about how contracts should be formed. You see, um, in the same token, we have on page forty, the third bullet. It says. Financial controls procedures, time reporting, required expenditure, and then it goes further to say standard contract provisions. You see, so this is not a it's not a bad thing. It's not way out. It's just that the mention of the contract here in the OPAs is really more about vehicles that you could use and different agreements and arrangements you could use, but the specific agreements being talked about in Develop Project Charter are those between you and your client. All right. Red Nitro, my good friend who has been on the channel, thank you very much for your activism. <laughs> your activities on the channel, it's always good to hear from you. And, you know, you, 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 of course you can become a PMP. I can put my money on it. Of course you can become a PMP. You know, the, the funny thing is the people who think that they don't want to become PMPs sometimes are the people who actually do. You know, I remember a conference back in in Anaheim in 2012. I was speaking to the good people of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. And I said, how many of you have got a date fixed for your PMP? A few hands came up. I say, how many of you have actually decided to take the PMP exam? And all the hands come up, but one sitting on my left. I say, um, excuse me, sir, could you please tell us why you are not very keen on the PMP exam, and he proceeds to say, Phil, I just need to know more about this certification before committing to it. Now, two and a half months later, who was the first person that got certified? It was him. <laughs> the person who said, I don't even know whether I'm going to take this thing or not, was the very first person to. So I got no doubts that you can make it happen, that you can do it. Okay? All right. Well, I'm I'm happy that you found value from that. Thank you all very much for joining. Remember to subscribe so you get notifications when I am actually like live online at that very moment. I know over the past few weeks you've been seeing a lot of content. And the reason is I just want people to get this exam done in 2019. Um, I'm not able to be online as much because I've got a lot of contracts and projects I'm working on. Um, that I just sapping up all my time, but I said tonight I gotta go talk to my peeps. I gotta go see my peeps, and that's why I came on live. I've got stacks of work waiting for me on my other machine. I'm actually dreading opening it up because I know it's gonna go on for hours on end because I've got a lot of deliverables. Talk about projects. I know exactly how you feel. You know, a lot of folks say, "Phil, are you are you just a trainer?" But those who know know I'm a project manager as well. I don't just train, I manage projects and I've got boatload of stuff I need to do for my projects. And um, as our friend Bob said, I'm still learning. Trust me, I am still learning. Arif, my good friend, how are you? I hope you're well and um, I actually did speak about you earlier, but I don't know if you were on. I kept your uh, name withheld, but I did talk about a little discussion we had had earlier this week. But uh, good to see you, everyone else. Thank you very much for joining. And um, I look forward to seeing you again on one of these live sessions. Keep doing what you need to do. Are there any questions before we jump off? Any questions whatsoever? Questions, comments, concerns? Because you know that's why I come here. To talk about questions you got. Have you got any questions or concerns? Any doubts? Is there anyone who thinks they cannot be a PMP? I hope you don't have those ideas. Those are gremlins. Gremlins residing on your shoulder. You need to get rid of them. <laughs> okay, my friends, I appreciate you, and I will see you in another episode hopefully soon. Take care, and bye for now.